South Dakota's educational effort to raise awareness about the importance of soil health continues. The USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service entered into a cooperative agreement with the South Dakota No-Till Association and I Grow South Dakota State University Extension for delivering these seminars with the latest soil health and productivity technology to South Dakota farmers and ranchers. I uh, grew up in the northeastern corner of the state, up a little town called Crystal, about 30 miles south of Canada, 30 miles west of Minnesota. Potatoes, sugar beets, wheat, edible beans every now and then, sunflowers and canola. That's the sort of stuff uh, I grew up with. Uh, a couple, about two months ago, I used to be a single parent to uh, a Gordon Setter that, Setter that has a pheasant problem. So if you got a pheasant problem, um, I'd love to help you. No longer a single parent, got married about two months ago. She's very happy. <laughs> and uh, I like to think of myself as a, a walleye fisherman with a soil science problem. Uh, I spend my weekends uh, chasing walleyes, guiding for Mitchell's Guide Service up on Devil's Lake. So if anybody wants to trade some walleye fishing for some pheasant hunting, my contact info is right there. So uh, I'm going to talk about managing saline soils uh, through cropping systems. Uh, so this is the state of North Dakota. There was some work done in 2010 that estimated there's roughly 5.7, 5.8 million acres of our soils are adversely affected by salinity. When we look at that, that's roughly the size of Vermont. And this is what Vermont would truly look like if we superimpose that on North Dakota. So that's, that's a big chunk of our state causing a lot of issues. That's where I spend most of my time working with farmers to manage these saline areas. So a lot of terms get thrown out. Salinity, sedicity, uh, alkalinity, what does all that stuff mean? With salinity, we're talking about the salts. Sedicity, we're talking about too much sodium in the soil. Um, usually the car common farmer lingo back home is they call the salty areas the alkaline ground. Is that the same term down this way? Alkalinity is actually a term that should be used referring to pH with, with uh, soils with the pH higher than 8.5 does a lot of nasty things. Phosphorus gets tied up, uh, iron gets tied up, uh, so that sort of stuff. So when we say saline soils, we define that as having an electrical conductance or EC greater than four decisiemens per meter. Well, when the researchers test it, we do a test called the saturated paste. We take a chunk of soil, we add a little bit of water, we mix it around. Take a chunk of soil, add a little bit of water, mix it a little, a little bit around, add some more water, keep mixing until it kind of looks like uh, the stuff you get from Dairy Queen, uh, soft serve ice cream. Then they, uh, they suction off the solution off of it and measure it. Well, our testing labs, that takes a lot of time to get the saturated paste going on. So what they do, they do one part soil, one part water, mix it up together. So chances are when you get that test back, from your uh, testing lab, it's that one-to-one -one number. To get it close to what that actual saturated paste is, we multiply that by two. Now that uh, publication that got uh, passed around by Anthony, there are some regression lines in there uh, based on soil texture to get you a little bit closer to what that saturated paste of your EC would be, but multiply it by two, that'll get you pretty close. Usually in soils, uh, pH is less than 8.5, SAR, that stands for sodium absorption ratio. That's the test that we use to define if the soil is sodic or not. Our soils act a lot like a magnet. They got this negative charge caused by clays and organic matter. We have calcium magnesium, they got these plus two charges. So they help hold that soil together and it acts a lot like a magnet. That helps, gives it structure, water can infiltrate, plant roots can grow down, it's a great thing. Now you take sodium, it has a plus one charge. But it can, because of that plus one charge, it can only attach to one side of that soil surface. So when we get too much sodium, instead of having some of that soil structure, there's this dispersion effect. And it's like rush hour traffic in Chicago. Everything's going whichever way, soils get compacted, water doesn't want to infiltrate, stuff like that. So this sodium absorption ratio test is testing that ratio of calcium magnesium, that's what holds the soil together, versus the sodium that causes that dispersion effect. Usually we see high pH soils in these areas. If you think you might have an SAR problem, um, look at the pHs. If they're over five or over eight, uh, you might want to have that test run. 
Then we have saline sodic soils, and it's both. It has high salts and it also has uh, sedicity issues. I'm going to focus most of this talk on salinity. Just wanted to mention sedicity in case you think you might have this problem, have an idea what's going on. Uh, so this is what sedicity looks like. It uh, has this columnar structure, uh, these biscuit tops, and it's just really hard and uh, stuff doesn't want to infiltrate, but we usually don't see that at the top of the soil surface. Usually it's in our subsurface, six inches down, a foot down, a couple feet down. So uh, to really see if you have that issue, uh, you need to go out and take that shovel and take a look to see what that structure looks like. So with salt, it, help, it prevents that plant from taking up water. It, uh, usually in these saline areas, we see it in our wetter, lower areas of our field, so there should be adequate moisture, right? But the salt prevents that water from infiltrating into the plant. So what it really does is it's tricking that plant into thinking that a drought's going on. And when it comes to salt management, it comes down to water management. Uh, this is a research site that we had over in Carrington, center part of the state. And uh, we had one of those June rains. We got half an inch of rain or something like that in about 10 minutes. And this was all white. But after the rain, we have all these little white circles. Those are individual raindrops that hit. It dissolved the water. So these are soluble salts that we're talking about. And it even impacted it so hard that it kicked some of the salt up on top. And uh, once it dried out, we see these salt deposits on our little kosher weeds. So we need five different things to have soil salinity. First thing is we need to have water. Since uh, 93, 94, whatever, we've been pretty darn wet in North Dakota. Um, I'm old enough to still remember 88 and 89 a little bit, but it's still kind of fuzzy in my head. So most of my experience with agriculture so far has been the wet cycle. We also need water-soluble salts. And for that, we're talking about sodium sulfate, sodium chloride, uh, calcium sulfate, that would be uh, gypsum, the stuff that sheetrock's made out of. Uh, magnesium sulfate, that's Epsom salt. These salts dissolve easily in water. Now there's things like calcium carbonate or lime. That stuff doesn't dissolve in water. It takes a lot and a lot of water to move that stuff. That's why when, uh, if you've ever seen a soil pit and, and somebody's taking their acid bottle, looking for that stuff to fizz, they're testing for the lime and they're trying to get an idea of where that water table has a tendency to sit at because it's been sitting there for 10, 20, 30,000 years, whatever. We also need a recharge area. That's where water enters the soil. And we need a discharge area. That's where groundwater becomes surface water. That's where we see the salt spots. And it's these, knowing these landscapes and how they work is what it takes to really get down and manage these areas. And you also have to have an uh, area where evaporation is greater than infiltration. We have that. So evaporation and capillary rise are the salt's conveyor belt. We have lots of salts, lots of minerals in our soil, but when it's down four or five feet, that isn't adversely affecting the plant. It's when they get brought up to the surface of the soil in that root zone that we start seeing these issues. So under the conventionally tilled system, we have a lot of evaporation. So that moves the salts up to the surface. That's the conveyor belt. Now, with a no-till system, I'm not saying you're gonna necessarily fix it just by going no-till, but you're having some mulch out there, so it's gonna reduce the evaporation. And you're gonna have more infiltration. And when that water goes down, it dissolves the salts and leaches those salts down. So with capillary rise, we're talking about how water can move up the different size soil particles. When you go to McDonald's, you get a, you get a straw, you throw in your Coke, that, uh, that water level sits pretty darn close to what it is in your Coke straw. Now, if you go get a cocktail, when you get those little tiny straws, look at where that, that water level is inside the straw, and it's gonna be a lot higher in reference to the Coke straw. That's because it's a smaller pour, so it has more capillary rise. So things like clay, silty clays, that can raise water up, whereas sand can't raise it up as much. Uh, here, when we look at a, a silt loam, it can raise the, the water table by about five feet, whereas we're talking sand, only about two feet. So there's a huge difference in soil textures. So this is what a saline seep looks like in my head. We have a recharge area up here. That's where the water is entering the soil. 
Then this SS, those are soluble salts. They get dissolved, they move down the soil, and then they hit an impermeable layer, and then they start moving laterally. Now, due to erosional processes, we usually see our finer textured soils sitting at the bottom of the hill. So that's where that capillary rise comes into play. So it dissolves the salts, moves here, stuff moves up, water evaporates, the salts get left behind. So over time, these salts accumulate and cause these issues. A uh, typical landscape that we see in North Dakota, hilltop up here, looks all nice. Down there at the discharge area, bottom of the hill, it's all white. Nothing wants to grow up there. I grew up with red tractors, and uh, we're supposed to be unbiased with who we support, so there's my unbiased who whatever tractor we support. <laughs> Everyone after this is red. But, uh, <laughs> We also see ditch effect salinization in our state. Um, that's where the recharge area is the ditch. And when there's water sitting in the ditch and it isn't draining, that water moves laterally out into the field. It dissolves the salts, and then we have evaporation and discharge here. And these areas run parallel to the road. This is one of our uh, fields that I grew up farming. We got a road here. Uh, this was taken in 1997. Stuff looks okay. <coughs> We fast forward to 2009 and it doesn't look okay anymore. We got these white spots and they're running pretty darn close to parallel with that road. And um, that's classic ditch effect salinization. Um, old man sends me to college for six years or whatever, get an undergrad master's degree in soil science and he's like, kid, help me manage these areas. And I'm trying to tell him it's about water management, we need to get water down. He took that in his mind and thinks, I need to go out with a river. We don't own a river on the Augustine seed farm, however, we have a chisel plow, and when you put the booms up, it goes down a lot deeper, similar to a river. You can almost see the salt pop up right behind it, because you got that evaporation going on, and the salt, there's still a lot of salt down there, and you're bringing it up to the top. Wetland salinization, we see these white grains that go around wetlands. Um, similar effect, what's going on with the ditch effect, but we don't have an impermeable layer, so the water goes both ways. Uh, so this is a random wetland, um, northeast of Devil's Lake a little bit, 1990. You can see it kind of looks like a kidney. A little wet. Fast forward to 97, looks a lot wet. Now, we look at it in 2009, and we have this white spot and it almost perfectly mimics the shape of that water body. And that's because that water can go out whichever direction. Um, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about salinity tolerances of different crops. That uh, uh, Dave Franzen publication, that's where I got most of this stuff. First thing to keep in mind, soybeans hate salt. Um, this is what it looks like in an EC of 0.3, looks happy. An EC of 3.9, not so happy. Uh, 8.1, 11.3, it just got jackhammered by Goldberg and was tapped out. <laughs> Nobody watched WCW. <laughs> uh, barley, one of the more salt tolerant type things. Doesn't look too bad when the EC is 0.5. Doesn't look too bad, 4.2, 8.3. Yeah, we're seeing some differences, 11.6. There's definitely some differences, but something's growing out there. And this is the side-by-side -side comparison. Uh, just a touch of salt with uh, the barley and the soybeans. Uh, a lot more salt with barley and soybeans. So this is what the different crops look like based on salinity. On the x-axis, we have our different levels of EC. That's the saturated paste I was talking about. So when you get your numbers, you need to multiply them by two. On the y-axis, we have our relative yield. So we got dry beans, Corn and flax are almost identical. Those don't do worth a darn. Alfalfa, um, there's some uh, alfalfa varieties that are being sold as salt tolerant. Uh, it does better than what older alfalfa varieties are, but I don't think tolerant is the right word for it. But there is some stuff uh, in genetics <coughs> are improving with it. Soybeans, I already told you that soybeans hate salt. 
However, sunflowers aren't too bad. Canola isn't too bad. I grew up in beet territory, so uh, it's nice to see the beets are working. Barley and wheat, they're uh, some of the better selections for these areas. Uh, some of these salt tolerant forages, when it's paper white and that EC level is through the roof, these are the sorts of things you need to be looking at. Wild rye, tall wheatgrass, Russian wild rye, AC salt lager, western wheatgrass. And when you plant that stuff, that's perennial cropping. Don't till it under, don't kill it, let the stuff grow. Something growing is using up the water, and it's better than having nothing. Even in areas where you only have kochia or you only have foxtail barley growing, it's better than having nothing growing. Now you need to do some weed control. And in some of these areas, farmers are going out and mowing that stuff down instead of going out with a cultivator or going out with some glyphosate. Some moderately tolerant forages with the ECs between 10 and 15, uh, crested wheatgrass, thick spike wheatgrass, uh, these prairie core grasses and creeping foxtail, those do pretty good on wetter sites. Uh, Canada wild rye, buffalo grass. And now we're starting to get those moderately sensitive forages and these are kind of the levels where some of those cover, if you're going to plant sunflowers or, or uh, barley as a cover crop, um, that might be a little bit cheaper than this. I, I don't know off the top of my head, but these are some of those more salt uh, sensitive type crops. Um, if you're playing around thinking about uh, cover cropping, sometime you should Google Mandan ARS, uh, Dr. Liebig. He put this together a couple of years ago. It's the cover crop chart. Kind of set it up like the periodic table. We have grasses, we have all our different broadleafs, and when we select one of those, we get a lot more information on the characteristics of those different, uh, those different cover crops. Uh, the ones that I have circled, barley, wheat, uh, rye, triticale, canola, mustard, beets, uh, shouldn't have carrot circled, uh, safflower, sunflower, those are things in salt tolerant cover crop mixes you should consider. So let's say we click on radishes. So left click radish. This is what comes up. All sorts of information. Cool season broadleaf, annual, high water use, so that's a good thing for salinity management. However, poor salinity tolerance. So uh, then it gives you uh, what, it, what it might uh, use for uh, a cattle feed and some other things. Um, we have the North Dakota Agricultural Weather Network in North Dakota, and there's these weather sites all across the state. Every county has at least one, and a handful of counties have three or four of them. And when you go to this website, they have this nifty little tool that you can estimate the water use. So uh, this is for uh, 2013 at the Oak Station. Uh, so our total rainfall was 23.64. In that time, between the 1st of May and the 15th of October, and maybe it was a little early on that date that I was still ice fishing the 5th of May that year. But um, we used almost 26 inches of rainfall with alfalfa. So we got a two, two inch uh, deficit. So we're drying down that soil. Now we look at sugar beets, uses a lot of water, we still have a little bit of excess. Now we start getting the corn, we're almost at four inches of excess moisture. Uh, soybeans, almost five inches. Potatoes, six and a half. Sunflowers, 7.7. .7. Dry beans, almost nine. Wheat, nine and a quarter. Barley, almost uh, a little over 11 inches of excess rainfall. Uh, there's some work done over at the Williston Research Extension Center. So now we're in the heart of the Bakken over on the western end of the Montana border. Um, uh, Jim Stereka was looking at water use of different crops as well as fallow systems. Um, it's weird having conversations with my dad and. Uh, the neighbors growing up with that they used to fallow and they fallowed to conserve water well they till today to dry down the soil so soils magically changed 30 years ago I don't know but there is a short-term drying effect but in the long run when that soils fallow you're conserving water the most efficient way to uh, manage this water is by having something growing out there and you can see that uh, the water's about the same, then we get to the middle of July, that crop system is really drying down the soil, whereas that fallowed system, uh, we're accumulating water. So I set up a couple different scenarios. Uh, we're looking at plant and cover crops the 5th of August, or we have emergence on the 5th of August, 
or we have emergence on the 5th of September. And again, this is over at the Oak Station. Uh, barley, if we planted the 5th of August, and I assume the 15th of October for most of these things, because uh, we'll still see barley, uh, soy, or not soy, but uh, barley and sugar beets, radishes, those things will stay green well into November in most areas of North Dakota. So 15th of October is the dead date, we're calling that. Uh, barley would use about eight inches, wheat a little less than eight, sunflowers uh, about seven and a half, dry beans seven inches, soybeans almost six inches, corn a little bit less, sugar beets a little bit less. So that's the water that could be used yet in uh, that six week period or, or that eight week period. And if we look at the 5th of September now, that water use goes down quite a bit. Uh, barley used about three inches, wheat 2.64, dry beans uh, 2.4, and so on. So what if we planted winter wheat, harvested timely, uh, usually in North Dakota, that would be the end of July. So we have a week, we, can, we have time to go out and put some cover crops down, and we put some cover crops behind it. So that total rainfall was about 23 and a half inches. Winter wheat would use about 14 and a half inches. So we have that surplus now of nine and a quarter. Well, Maybe we should plant some cover crops out there. Let's plant something salt tolerant because we have some salt issues. So let's throw some sunflowers in there. That would have used about seven and a half inches. So now we got about two inches of excess moisture versus nine and a quarter. So that isn't using up all the water, but you're in a lot better situation had you left that ground, that ground fallow. And we're getting a mix of a broadleaf and a grass. That wheat's growing all year long, and we're throwing some sunflowers in at the end of the year. So we're adding some diversity to this. Now let's say we're looking at dry beans. Now we're harvesting uh, early September. Well, we would have had about eight inches of excess moisture, and then let's throw some barley in uh, for a mix. We're six inches of excess moisture, but that's still about three inches better than what you would have done. So managing these saline seeps, it comes down to knowing the landscape. Where is the water coming from? Where is the water going? There's been a lot of work done with alfalfa, and they've been able to fix these areas with alfalfa. One of the reasons is it uses a lot of water, but it also has a really deep rooting structure. So it acts almost like a dam and prevents that water from going over that salty spot. Now, where this used to be white, you're not going to get that alfalfa to grow. So in that white spot, this is where you want to you, you want to plant those those salt tolerant cover crop mixes, or maybe you want to have um, some of those those uh, highly tolerant forages, the the western wheatgrass, the AC salt wagon, those sorts of things. And there's my red tractor again. Uh, and the same thing we see with the ditch effect. Uh, we need to intercept the water and prevent that lateral movement out into the field. Because if we don't prevent that lateral movement of water, that's going to keep going out and I'm going to lose uh, a row of sunflowers every year out there. And the same thing uh, with that wetland uh, salinization management. It's trying to contain it so it doesn't spread. So I got some farmers now that are starting to look at, and look at doing this, and some of them are practicing it where they're cropping most of the field like they normally would. However, when they're in these salty areas, they're starting to plant buffer strips of alfalfa or maybe just cover crops. But in these really high saline areas, that's where they're putting in the AC salt landers or if it's low enough, they're planting some of those salt tolerant cover crop mixes, something with some uh, sunflowers, some sugar beets, some barley, something like that. So this is some stuff over at the Carrington Research Extension Center. Uh, I was there for four years before moving out to mine it. This is one of our research sites. <coughs> the thing that we have going on here is we aren't just dealing with, so, with uh, a saline seep, we're also dealing with the ditch effect. So this is a two-headed monster that we're managing. That salt is pretty much parallel with the road, so we know it's ditch effect salinization, and this is up a little bit higher than down there. So ideally to manage this, where it's good, that's where you want to put your regular crop rotation. Where it's not so good, that's where you want to start planting the, those salt tolerant things, uh, maybe some alfalfa, something to dry down the water. Because if we don't contain it and manage it now, it's only going to get worse next year. So I want to point out there's this tree here. 
So this is looking down to the, the southeast. So there's that tree right there. So when we first started managing this in 2009, the EC levels were 22, 21, something like that. It was almost paper white. Um, there's not even kosher or foxtail barley growing out there. So that stuff is pretty nasty. Now, we fast forward to 2012, and there's that tree again, and we got some stuff growing. So we're doing some reclaiming. We're moving that ground back in the right direction. Now this is just foxtail barley in this picture, but there was nothing growing there before, so I know that we've improved it. And with uh, measuring the soil salinity, when right here was 22, now it's down to like a 13. Still aren't gonna really get anything on a cash crop, but we're improving the land. So, like I said before, we got a recharge area here. Our ditches are a recharge area. White spot, that's where the discharge area is. And this is what um, our stuff looked like. We're evaluating the salinity tolerances of different cover crop mixes, different alfalfas, things like that. And what's going on is we're managing that recharge area so it doesn't discharge. And if we were to also try to manage that ditch effect salinization, we'd move it uh, in a better direction faster yet. So we're only tackling one of the, one of the monsters, not both of them. Um, just wanted to mention tile quick. It does work, it's very expensive. I try to work with farmers to do their cropping management first, and this is a last resort. There's a lot of issues that goes with it with water quality and whatever else, but it does work. Uh, this is some work done by Eggweiss, their soil testing lab in North Dakota. Uh, on our X axis, we have different GPS locations. On our Y axis, we have different salts. Now, this is in millimoles, that's a one to one, so we need to multiply that by two actually. Um, the red is 2002 and they definitely had some salinity issues. 2006, a little bit better. 2011, it's, it moved in a pretty good direction. But that's in nine years, about a thousand bucks an acre. Those cover crops, a lot cheaper and we've moved it in a better direction, uh, a lot greater. So we went from a 22 down to about a 13 in the worst areas in like four or five years. This is nine years to only move it uh, that much. And also too, if you put tile in, the salt isn't gonna magically disappear. You need, you need snowfall, you need rain, you need those leaching events to take the salt out. So in summary, salinity is caused by excessive water that brings salts into the root zone. Salinity management is water management. Salts move up with the water, they move down with the water. As we dry down the soils, those salts will move down with it. We need to think about the landscapes. We see those white spots in the lower areas of our field, and that's where the grain monitor goes down to nothing, and that's what annoys us. But the problem's coming from someplace else, and we need to find the source of it in order to fix the symptoms. Tillage and crops manage water. However, evaporation can make your soils more prone to salinization, erosion, and you're gonna lose organic matter. Crops utilize more water than tillage and have greater benefits to the soil. Um, when you're doing these salinity uh, management things and you keep on top of that salinity, when that number starts coming back up, don't plant soybeans there, plant wheat, plant something more salt tolerant in those areas. With that, uh, are there any questions? Is EC something that you can get on your soil samples from like Eggvise or somebody like that? Yeah, it's, uh, it's just another box to check for the most part. What was the question again? The question was, is EC something that's easily soil tested? And uh, every soil test form to fill out that I've seen has had EC on it. I'd be surprised if a soil testing lab didn't offer that. Yes, sir? If you were going to get that block Okay, the question was, if you're gonna get that blocking effect with the alfalfa, how many years to fix it, am I right? Okay, um, so that stuff that we did, uh, that was in a matter of four years. We took it from a 22 or a 21 down to like a 13 in the worst. And we reclaimed an area that was nine acres of really bad soil down to about four now. And that's a couple years old, it's gotten better yet. I, um, I'm not in Carrington anymore, so I don't have the most up-to-date data. Um, there's a bunch of work done in the late 70s with alfalfa and salinity management. 
Um, they were fixing these areas in five to seven years. But it also depends upon what the water is, well, how much rainfall you get, all those sorts of factors. Alfalfa uses a lot of water, but it's also one of the easiest things to drown out. So it's kind of a catch-22 there, but it's the king water user. How do you know where the problem areas are coming from? How do you know where those problem areas are coming from? Um, a lot of it is just gut instinct when you're sitting down at the field looking where the high ground is. Is that water? Chances are it's coming towards you. That's, that's how I've gone about doing it, and um, I'm, I'm sure I haven't been right all the time, but um, that, that's where I look at it. Now, if, if you're talking like that ditch effect, when you see that white spot running perfectly parallel with the road, no question is that coming from the ditch. Now, when we're talking those seeps, uh, it's a matter of where do you think the water's coming from, it, it, you know? And, and it isn't like you just have one straight hill going that way, you know, you got a whole three-dimensional landscape and so you know it can't be just one strip that way it's got to you know encompass the whole area from where that water could be coming from. Now with those high salt tolerance cover crops is that something you have to take off the ground to move the salt away from that so do you have to cut it bale it move it away or is it just being utilized by the plant? Um, the plants don't take it up if they don't have to. Right. My understanding of it is if you bale it, you're not gonna necessarily be translocating the salt. It's, it moves with the water. And the only reason why the salt levels in your soil test went down is because they've been translocated deeper in the soil. So it goes down, gotcha. There are some plants that accumulate salt. So you never salt. actually get rid of the salt. It no, just it's, goes it's still there, but it's not adversely affecting your soils. And that's why you need to stay on top of those soil tests. When those numbers start coming up again, you gotta, okay, we need to start planting, we need to go back to, being on top of it. Yes, sir? When you're sampling your soil, how deep you want to go? When you're sampling your soil, how deep do you want to go? Yep. Um, usually most of the stuff, uh, it's just zero to six. That's the stuff we're worried about. Now, um, if you're fighting the salt, a six to 24, seeing where that salt is, uh, is a good indicator to see, are you making progress? Because if it's decreasing up here, it should be increasing down here, but when you have those two different soil tests, you can actually see, get an idea of how much you've, you've moved from up here to down there. Yes, sir? Did they try adding lime to bind the salt up? The only way to remove salts is with management, is with water management. Um, there, there's all sorts of products out there that are supposed to do miracle things. I call them snake oils. Iowa State has one heck of a website called the Iowa State Compendium of Non-Conventional Soil Amendments, something like that. And when I get questions about whatever product I'm not familiar with, first place I go is that and it's a great source of information on various products. If something's been researched, um, uh, if something's been researched, chances are it has it there. Uh, as for like lime and that, lime isn't gonna affect the salt because it doesn't dissolve. Now, if you have a pH issue, lime is a good thing to have. We don't have pH issues for the most part in North Dakota. Now, um, one of the things to fix some of those sodic soils is adding gypsum, calcium sulfate. Because you're adding calcium, you know, instead of having rush hour traffic in Chicago, maybe it's more like Sioux Falls or whatever, because you're, you're adding plus two ions to there. And the problem with that is if it's so, or if it's saline too, you're adding more salt to the system. So bottom line is, you got that salt there, you're gonna manage it because it's not gonna go away. Say that again? It's not going away. It, 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 you need to stay on top of that water management to move those salts down. Unless you're going to open a salt mine. Unless you're going to open up a salt mine. Yes, sir. Is it a valid approach to put a tile line to drain it down out? Is it a valid approach to install tile line to manage it? A lot of that's been done in North Dakota, and that, that data I showed you is one of the success stories of it. It works. There's. Uh, Right now, it runs about a thousand bucks an acre. 
in, in, in the Red River Valley. Um, so it's expensive, but uh, it does work, and there are other issues that goes with it, environmental, all that sort of stuff. I'm not here to talk about that, but it does work. Yes, sir. When you're seeding the cover crops in the affected area, how far beyond the affected area do you want to go in order to soak up some of that moisture that's coming, that's draining down okay. from the upslope? So the question is, you're planting some cover crops in one of these salty areas, how wide should you really put it? Um, the stuff that I've been reading, um, and it's highlighted in that, that publication, about 40, 50 feet, something like that. Should so, excuse me? Should be able to see you, should, you should be That'd able be to see like Yeah, and, and, and like, so you, you plant the cover crops in what you think is the bad area, you go in with some corn, you got some really bad looking corn, um, look at where that is and maybe, uh, uh, kill that off and plant some cover crops in an area like that. You know, it, it, it does vary from situation to situation. If you want to get on top of it as fast as you absolutely can, plant the whole field of alfalfa. But do you have dairy? Do you have this to get? Do you have a market for the alfalfa versus uh, a soybean market? So those are some of the considerations you have to take into account. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you. Very much.